Okay, Alfie Poon aus England ähm, von der Hans Sabatis Global Network Group. Und ähm, sein Vortrag wird auf Englisch sein ähm, und knüpft damit halt an die äh, Aktionsformen an, Tierrechtsbefreiung der Tierrechtsbewegung, die André in dem vorangehenden Vortrag vorgestellt hat. Alfie Moon. Hi, oh, this is loud. Okay, right, hi, my name is Alfie Moon. I think my volume down a little bit there. Um, it doesn't work with that. Okay, so just that one? Yeah. Okay, right, thank you. Right, uh, I apologize for speaking in English. I have been trying to learn German since February, but unfortunately, I spend so much time rescuing animals, I find it very difficult to find the time to study. Um, I've been a hunt saboteur for the last 33 years. Um, I'm the group contact for the South London Wildlife Group, which is a group of hunt saboteurs. And about eight years ago, um, I was asked to join the committee of the Hunt Saboteurs Association. Three years ago, I was elected as the information officer of the Hunt Saboteurs Association. And two years ago, I was one of the founder members of the Hunt Saboteurs Global Network. The Hunt Saboteurs Global Network started when I met two American Hunt Saboteurs at the International Animal Rights Conference in Luxembourg in 2012. Soon afterwards, they stayed with us in London and sabotaged two fox hunts with us. In April 2013, I went to the United States where I delivered two presentations in Portland and Seattle and acted as an advisor on sabotaging the sea lion cull at the Bonneville Dam near Portland. At the International Animal Rights Conference in 2013, one of the American SABs did a joint presentation with me on our experiences of sabotaging hunts in each other's countries. After the presentation, activists from across Europe came to talk to us about sabotaging hunts in their countries. We decided to set up the Hunt Saboteurs Global Network to locate and support existing hunt sab groups around the world and to help to establish new groups where none exist at the moment. So if you are already a hunt saboteur and you want to find out about more about other hunt saboteurs or if you'd like to start a new hunt sab group, please come and talk to me. Uh, I've got my card on the hunt sab stool um, over to the right of us here. Um, anybody that wants to get involved in hunt sabotage, I'm the man to talk to. All right. Hunt sabotage can be carried out by individuals or small groups, or it can be done by large numbers of activists. Um, the internet, including social media, posters and leaflets, and this is a photograph of a sponsored walk we did against the Badger Cull in England, uh, all important in attracting new activists to hunt sabotage and in uh, fundraising to support sabbing activities. The sponsored walk that's shown here raised over £600 to support our action against the Badger Cull. So that was just two of us walking for 15 kilometres, made £600. And some of the sabbing stuff is really quite expensive. He says dropping the technology. For example, hunt sabs use radios to keep in communication with each other. A radio like this can cost £100. So being able to raise £600 towards a purchase of equipment is really important. Um, there's a picture of a larger group of sabs. That's about 70 sabs closing in on um, a pheasant shoot in the Badger Cull Zone in Somerset last year. So. The Hunt Saboteurs Global Network has a website, www.hsgn.org, which has email addresses available for SABs in any country um, who wish to use them, and a Facebook page. All SABs are welcome to post on the um, HSGN Facebook page, but if you have your own group established, having your own website and Facebook presence will help your group to grow. The Hunt Sab Global Network is also producing merchandise to help fund its activities, like the t-shirt I'm wearing, he says, plugging it horribly. Right. Once a group is established, the Hunt Sab Global Network will provide support. This year we have advised groups in Lille and Bordeaux by email and provided two three-hour training sessions to a group of hunt saboteurs in Paris. Two of the Paris Sabs joined us to sabotage a hunt in England and we're hoping to take a group of Sabs to France later this year. The Hunt Sab Global Network is following the example of the Hunt Saboteurs Association by combining non-violent direct action with campaigning. We're currently working on European Union legislation to ban hunting with hounds based on an improved version of the Hunting Act 2005, which made hunting with hounds illegal in England and Wales. The question I'm sure many of you would want to ask is how do you actually sabotage a hunt? There's no simple answer to this. It depends on the type of hunting, the laws about hunting and sabotaging, and how violent the hunters are likely to be. And the man shown in the photograph there, Mark Bycroft, who's the huntsman of the hunt nearest to where I live, is a very violent man. Um, 
in all cases, the first stage is research. You have to find out where the hunt is going to take place, what type of hunting, for example, hunting with hounds, as shown here, um, shooting, trapping, snaring, how many hunters they're likely to be, what laws might help or hinder you, and how likely it is that the police will turn up. You also need to know how many saboteurs you will have and what sort of transport you'll have available. I'll go with some case studies of some typical hunt sabbing that we're involved in. Um, this is a typical Saturday in South East England where the main target is the fox hunters. Obviously, we've got 50 years experience of dealing with this particular type of hunt. The first hunt sabotage was in Boxing Day 1963, where a group of activists threw 25 kilograms of meat into the path of the hunting hounds. So the hounds ate the meat and didn't want to chase the foxes after that. Obviously, most hunt, most hunt sabs these days are vegan and wouldn't put meat in front of the hounds, but we have used vegan dog biscuits to great effect. Um, we know the places where the hunts are likely to gather in the mornings, they're called meets, so we sometimes we get information on where the meat is likely to be, sometimes we simply put vehicles outside the hunt kennels and follow their vehicles to the meet, but one way or another we will find them. Um, any, a group of anything up to 50 hunt saboteurs will gather, um, usually in the Land Rover as shown here, great all-terrain vehicles that will go just about anywhere, although I have to admit my friend who was driving this one did get it horribly stuck on this very wet field and had to get one of the other hunt sabs to tow it out, so it was really embarrassing for him. <laughs> I don't do that bit when I'm in England. Um, right, so once the meeting point of the hunt is confirmed, groups of hunt saboteurs will split up. Normally you have some saboteurs on foot very close to the hunt, as shown here, where other groups um, in radio contact, this is where the radios are so vital, because the group that is closest to the hunt will be telling the vehicles which direction the hunt is heading in, and then the vehicles can carry other group of hunt saboteurs around, so there's always a group of hunt saboteurs coming towards the hunt. Now, fox hunting has been illegal since 2005 in England, um, although the hunts have completely ignored the law. However, they're usually very unwilling to actually hunt openly if there are hunt saboteurs present. So one of the main tools of the hunt saboteur is this video camera. This one links to the satellite, so it picks up the date, the time, and the exact location, and that makes for very good evidence in court. If the hunts try to hunt illegally and you can film them, they cannot argue that the film wasn't taken at the, the location you say it was taken at. Let's hope the wind stops blowing long enough. Okay. Um, if they do actually start to chase a fox, um, hunt saboteurs try to distract the hunting hounds using a variety of methods. We have um, a bottle of essential oil called citronella, I think it's called citronelle in German. Uh, it smells very strongly of lemons. As hunting hounds use their sense of smell to chase the foxes, when the foxes run past, the sim saboteurs simply spray the ground with the essential oil, and then the hounds cannot follow the scent of the fox, and then they're very confused because they do not know which direction they're meant to go in. Also, a huntsman will use um, a hunting horn, and I'll be honest here, I'm very bad at blowing this thing, and I've got friends who are very good at blowing this thing, but the huntsman uses this to give the hounds instructions on what to do. I'll try this. So th there are a variety of different calls that tell the hounds either to run faster or to come back to the huntsman. Well, of course, hunt saboteurs can learn to blow the hunting horn and give the hounds opposite instructions. So the idea is to confuse the hounds. Um, if they've stopped chasing the fox for the moment, another thing the huntsman will do, from when they're very young, the hounds are hit with a whip. So they associate the whip with doing something wrong. And the noise of the whip is an instruction to them from the huntsman in the field to stop doing what they're doing. Obviously, hunt saboteurs would never actually hit a hunting hound with a whip, but the noise of it tells them to stop. <laughs> so this noise to a hunting hound means stop what you're doing. If they're chasing a fox, the hunt saboteur uses this simple homemade device. It's a bit of a broom handle, some climbing rope, and a boot lace to give that instruction to stop to the hounds. And once the hounds have, oh, we're doing something naughty, we must stop, then you can use the hunting horn or voice calls to call the hounds over to you. It's one of the most fantastic moments in a hunt saboteur's life when the fox is running in that direction and all the hunting hounds are here and you're stroking them. <laughs> right. um, th another kind of hunting that we challenge in England is shooting. Sorry, I've lost track of my little presentation of... No, I'm going the wrong way. I've got the thing upside down. Bear with me a moment. Ah. 
Here's a little bit I missed out. The hunts don't like being filmed. You've got a picture here of our drone. So this is a camera mounted on a small radio-operated helicopter. And the hunts really don't like it when we're using this because it means that even if we're not close in on the hunt, we can still be filming them at distance. They're very paranoid about these. Um, and occasionally they bring in some country folk to try to stop the hunt saboteurs. The gentlemen here were sort of deliberately brought in to try to stop us from chasing the hunt around. It didn't work. I'm sorry, the photographs were a bit full. I don't know if you know, no, you probably can't make that out. Unfortunately, that's me on a day when it went horribly wrong and one of the huntsmen actually put my skull through. Um, that's me trying to get away afterwards. It doesn't happen very often, I have to say. Okay. Another type of shooting that we oppose, uh, another type of hunting we oppose is shooting. Um, again, I'm not sure how much you can see of the picture. If you can't see the photographs, if you come over to the hunt saboteur's stool afterwards, you can see the same presentation. It's a bit darker in there. I think the photo show up a bit better. This is a baby pheasant. Uh, I don't think you can see it. it, has a ring through its nose. This is because the pheasants are factory farmed. Thousands of pheasants are kept in a very small pen when they're young pheasants. They have the ring through their nose so they can't bite each other. When they're old enough, the ring is removed, they're sent into the countryside and then they shoot them. In England, we have the advantage that the law says that if, you, if there is a human being between you and the animal you're trying to shoot, you must open the gun and take out the bullets. So if we find people who are shooting, we simply stand between them and the pheasants. They know that they must unload the gun. Um, and most of the time they do. They usually call the police, but it can take a very long time to get enough police officers out from the nearest towns into the countryside areas to actually deal with a group of 50 hunt saboteurs. And all the time that they're waiting for the police, they're not shooting anything. Job done. Uh, if the police do show up in sufficient numbers, um, we might decide that we have to retreat for a little while so we go and hide in the woods. After a little while the police become very bored and they go away and then we just come back and stand again between the shooters and the pheasants. Um, sometimes the police bring up a helicopter. This is very useful because of course all the time there is a helicopter the shooters can't shoot at the pheasants because they might hit the helicopter so they have to stop shooting and of course the noise of the helicopter scares all the wildlife out of the area. So a trick we would use here, if we have a big group of saboteurs, we would get six saboteurs who just run away. And the police think, oh, they must have done something illegal because they are running. So they send the helicopter to chase the six who are running. So you run round and round in circles with the helicopter chasing you for hours and hours and hours. And there's no shooting going on. It's great. OK. Um, occasionally, we go and do something a little bit more uh, unusual. We found out last year that the Scottish Government is permitting the shooting of 4,000 seals in Scottish waters every year. Seals are generally protected, but fishermen are exempt from the laws that protect the seals. So the fishing community in Scotland is killing about 4,000 seals a year, and we decided we were going to try to do something about this. Now, unfortunately, last year the plans fell through, but we went back this year, just two of us to start with. Um, we were planning to use our usual tactics of simply getting between the shooters and the animals they were trying to kill. So we had wetsuits and snorkeling gear and we were just going to jump into the North Sea and try not to get shot. Um, as it turned out that the shooters had changed where they were shooting the seals. So they, they weren't shooting them near to the villages, they were shooting them um, from some very steep sea cliffs. So we spent four days doing a lot of research, finding out all the places where they were likely to be killing the seals. Um, this is one of the fishing nets. This, this net is about 100 metres long and it stretches from the coast out into the sea and it's designed to catch the migrating salmon as they come into the rivers to spawn. So they kill all the salmon just before they lay their eggs and fertilise them. So of course it kills all the baby salmon for the following year. Quite incredible that they're allowed to do it. Um, but we found every single one of these fishing nets over about 100 kilometres of coastline. Um, you can, uh, it's a shame you can't see the terrain because this shows cliffs they are about 250 metres high and just sheer drop into the sea. It was really quite tricky conditions to be sabbing in. And here are the seal killers. You can even see the gun, uh, just about make out the gun in the boat, and the ammunition, which they hadn't secured, which is breaking the law in England. They're in a bit of trouble for that one. Um, and at the end of the four days of our research, we handed that information over to Sea Shepherd, who arrived with their inflatable boat. And every time that the seal killer set out from port to try to kill seals, the Sea Shepherd rib was between them and where they were trying to shoot the seals. Um, they got very angry. They attacked the Sea Shepherd people. They got arrested. Within a day, they'd actually... Oh, then 12 more hunt saboteurs arrived in the village, and then they didn't want to threaten anybody anymore. 
And then the same evening, they promised they wouldn't shoot any more seals in that part of Scotland. And by the end of the week, they said they'd given up fishing completely. So there's now 100 kilometres of coast where they don't kill seals and they don't net the salmon. So for four days' work, we thought that was a rather good result. And the main lesson from this for saboteurs trying to set up in other countries. Nobody had sabbed the seal cull in Scotland since the 1970s. So for 40 years, this hunt had been going on without anyone trying to stop it. In one year, we think by next year, we'll actually get the Scottish government to ban the shooting of seals completely. We did it by probably a month of extremely detailed research. We just found out every bit of information we could about the hunters before we went there. We gathered a lot of support from local people. I'm sure if you find out, if you go out into the German countryside, there might be people shooting everywhere, but there will be people who don't like those shooters everywhere too. And if you can get those people to feed you information, you're halfway there. Because when you get there, you'll have an idea of what's going on. When we did get there, the plans we went with didn't survive the first day, but we were just had to think quickly how to change those plans and be more effective. And again, if you get out into the areas of Germany where they're shooting, once you're on the ground, you, I'm sure you'll quickly formulate plans on how to actually stop the shoots from going on. And as if going up to northern Scotland wasn't um, <laughs> far enough afield, last year I actually went out to the United States, um, out at the Bonneville Dam, which is on the Columbia River near Portland, Oregon. Um, just as, the, as with the seals in Scotland, they're shooting sea lions for the heinous crime of eating a fish. What else are they going to eat, the sea lions? So there's this terrible thing. They catch them as they come into the, uh, the coast at a place called Astoria. They brand them. Uh, the day before I arrived, they actually brand, they had the brand too hot. They actually set fire to two sea lions with the brand. They actually caught fire because the brand was so hot. Once they've been branded, they're allowed to carry on up the river. When they get to the dam, um, it's an actually a US Army base, and there's US Army personnel on the dam with binoculars. If they see a sea lion eating fish, then um, that sea lion is condemned to death. Sea lions need to spend about 40% of their time out of the water. They don't let them. This little white boat might just about be able to make out there. Um, every time a sea lion gets on the shore, they fire explosive charges over its head to scare it. It gets back in the water. The only place it can get out of the water is into a floating trap like this. All right, so these si sea lions are now in this trap. As you can see, the doors are open. This military base is open to the public, but you have to go through an army checkpoint with armed American soldiers to get into the, into the area. At 5 o'clock in the evening, you have to leave. Uh, um, what we think is happening is that the sea lions that have been branded, that have been identified as having eaten fish, are then taken um, round to a thing called a killing barge, and they're killed. The bodies are then given to a local university for research purposes. But of course, all this is hidden because you've got to be off site by five o'clock. Now, these traps are not very easily accessible. You can't see them from places you're allowed to go. I'm a hunt sab, I'm not very good at observing where I'm allowed to go. So I sneaked in and got these very close-up photographs of the traps from um, a restricted area. As I came out, there were two armed soldiers waiting for me who wanted to know what I was doing in the restricted area, so I made the excuse that I'd just gone to the toilet. <laughs> where the point they pointed out there was a toilet block about 100 metres away, and they told me to use that one in future, which I told them I would. Um, but we got the photos. And in amongst that, I managed to do two presentations out in the States whilst I was out there and also managed to advise the local activists on how they could actually be more effective in stopping the sea lion cull. Again, with relevance to here, where I don't think there are very many hunt saboteurs here, there certainly aren't very many in the United States. Um, simple things like starting a poster campaign in the nearest town. Uh, put up some nice pictures of an animal, something that people will look at and go, ah, oh, isn't that nice? But then have a Hunt Saboteur's website address underneath so people know where to get into contact with if they want to stop hunting. Okay, two minutes, all right. I can keep talking as long as you like. I talk for a living. It's my job. No. Um. <laughs> now nah, that'll do. Right, I'll stop talking now. I'm sure you've actually heard plenty. Oh, just a couple more little things. Right, This is the badger cull in England last year. This is out set surveying. Before they, the government started killing the badgers in England, we got out, we spent about four months locating every single badger set in the cull zone. So when the killing started, we knew exactly where to go and defend them. And we found this poor little murdered. This is just before the cull started. This is a baby badger that's been gassed, which is completely illegal in England, but they do it anyway. 
And just to end on a happier note, this is one of the thousands of badges saved by the activists in the Gloucestershire coal zone last year. Alfie Moon, thank you very much for Welcome. this interesting presentation. <laughs> so, um, we don't have much time left. Are there any questions or comments? Two questions. Uh, it Please repeat. Yeah. Um, so if when we get the hounds to come to us now, we can't actually take them away. The police would stop us from actually attempting to remove the hounds that, that would be stealing. There was one very sad occasion where they were hunting a different type of dog, a, a beagle, much smaller dog, um, and one collapsed at the side of the road. Uh, it was frozen, and all we could do was actually give it back to the hunters because we didn't have the means to take it away. And I said to the huntsman, can I have that beagle? He said, yeah, I'm only going to shoot it when I get home. I don't want it. It's useless, that one. And unfortunately, there was a, then a bit of a confrontation between the saboteurs and the hunters. And at the end of the day, the, the, there were lots of police. I said, I'm going to go and get my beagle. And the policeman wouldn't let me go and collect the beagle, even though the huntsman said I could have it. So I know what was going to happen to that one. Okay, one more question. Apparently not. No? No one? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um.